No problemo. So today I made just two folders for playing around a little bit. One is a multi view data set. If we have time later, I kind of doubt it, but if then we will look at this. And here is just a very simple example of a stitching problem. I just opened one of those files. Okay. That's actually here from Janelia. That's from Jim Truman's lab. These um, Drosophila central nervous systems, three channel data. It's confocal actually, it's not light sheet, but it doesn't really matter, right? Uh, 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 60, 512, 512 by 60, uh, 86. So pretty small stacks and we have six of them that we want to put together. But it's a nice, simple example because everything is really quick. And the concept is the same for large data sets in some sense. There's not much different. So you will start, I mean, if you don't have it installed, you go to help update. Oh, I have no internet on here. There could be some other message other than I'm crashing now. If there's no internet. I mean, it says, do you have a network connection? I guess then also to everything else. So if you want to install this, oh, I forgot to upload this. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, sorry, I just realized I, I created a new release with support for something and I forgot to upload it to Big Stitcher. Okay, anyhow, what you need to do is to click on manage update sites and activate the Big Stitcher one. That's all you need to do. Then it asks you to install these plugins and then you restart Fiji and then it is there. And it's to do. Okay, then you go to plugins, Big Stitcher, Big Stitcher. And in the beginning, we define a project because usually you have many, many files or one big file with many, many different types of tiles and channels and what have you in there. And Big Stitcher needs to understand. And Big Stitcher and Big Data Viewer projects are completely compatible. Like we still has a few extra texts that it needs to understand what is the channel, what is the illumination, and, and what is the metadata, and so on and so on. But basically, we have to define that first. Once you have this defined, you can just select the project, and in the beginning, you define a new data set. And there are several ways how to define one. Usually, the first one is right, the automatic loader. Unless you run into any issues, don't use anything else. I mean, some of these are faster or specific to something, but some of them are outdated. This one is outdated, I should actually remove it because the automatic loader should do more or less everything. Automatic loader is not a good idea if you import 5,000 files because it uses bioformats and it looks at every file and tries to extract the metadata. It does nothing wrong, but if you import 5,000 files, it will take literally hours just to read the metadata. So there are other loaders which just say, okay, look at one and assume the rest is the same and you know stuff like that. So that's why the automatic, but usually the automatic loader is fine. Usually we don't have like 5,000 files, we have 10 or 10 and then it's all okay. Again, please interrupt me if something is unclear. So then you drag and drop the directory or files in here, right? It tells you which files it found. You can do wildcards, right? Seven, star, and, and so on, right? So typical things. You can exclude small files. Often you have like things on the file system, dot, dot DS store and Mac and Windows, and you know, so it, just, it doesn't look at these small ones. Then it will automatically go through these files. And that's what I said reading the metadata. It can be faster, can be slower, depending on what you're doing. Then it asks you inside these files, I detected three channels or illuminations. It asks that because bioformat still does not distinguish those. So it has to ask the user, what is it? There are three things in there. I mean, it can't be three illuminations, but yeah, in this case, we know it's channels and it, it automatically de detects patterns in your file names. So it will highlight them. There can be also two or three if you have time points and angles and what have you. In our case, these are not time points, these are actually tiles. You can also ignore a pattern. If there's a certain pattern, sometimes people put in timestamps or stuff like that. You can just say ignore that pattern and we'll just ignore it. It will try to read the voxel size as the most basic uh, uh, parameter, metadata parameter. In this case, it's gone because originally this were LSM files. Now we saved it as TIFF just because it's faster to read. So here I have to say I want to modify them. And I know it's roughly like this and it's micrometers. Something like this. Right? And then if it's a grid, you can basically move this interactively to its right location. Because if you have a CCI, it will read this metadata, the tiled metadata from file here, it will not, because there's just nothing in there. It's just six files and it doesn't know what to do with it. But if you have a CCI file or anything, it knows where to start from. By the way, all of this is macro recordable. There's always like, you know, macro scriptable versions of each of these things. 
So if you know what you're doing and you want to keep doing this over and over again, so usually the first time you look at some type of data, I go all manually, and then you, but then you can potentially automate everything that I'm doing here. But it's maybe a different uh, meeting also to explain how to do this. And then you can even run this on the cluster distributed, right? Let's say you have a thousand time points, you can easily separate this by time point and so on and so on. Good, okay. Now I see it, look through all of these files and now it asks you, okay, now I understood the data set, I understand what it is, what would you wanna do? You wanna keep it as it is and load the data virtually or raw every time you access it, or you wanna resave it. Typically you want to resave it, and if you don't do it on a cluster, usually HDA5 is the right choice, simply because you can have smaller block sizes. At the end, it's advantages. You get one H5 file for everything. So usually I do this on the cluster, and five is good. I have a good reason. The future also supports ZAR here, so you can basically resave it as whatever you want. But you can also work in this small case. You don't have to resave it. It's so small, it would be fine to do it with caching. But you know, this is a... The check stack size is something that has to be there. It's still a bug in bioformats that sometimes it assumes certain sizes of stacks and it's just not correct. So it has to go Sorry, to all the files. And, I have a, yeah. I have a question. Why, why do you want to resave it? So you can interactively browse it. Just imagine you have a terabyte of data, right? Uh, this is a more typical size for a, a stitching, not the 50 megabytes I have here. Sure. Your terabyte of data, this, does a, this creates a multi-resolution representation of the data. Otherwise, see, you could not interactively Oh, I see. Oh, multi-resolution is the important thing here. Yeah, okay, gotcha. Okay. okay. Now, blocked and multi-resolution, because if it's otherwise, you would have to load every plane. Once you turn the sample to the side, you, you know, it becomes very inefficient. Right, right, right. right so right. blocked and multi-resolution. Gotcha. Okay, thanks. It also says so here. I mean, maybe small to see, right? It says this is a multi-resolution HDR five. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, no, no. It's nothing. Yeah, I just overlooked that. Yeah. No problem. No problem. So then it does that. Some details about the resaving. Usually press OK, and it does that. It reads each file, saves multi-resolution level. In this case, only two because it's pretty small, so it doesn't make much sense. Big data viewer is smart enough to make educated guesses for how to resave this. Usually, this works pretty well. It does not work well if the metadata is wrong. So if your sample say it's isotropic data and it's not, then these are wrong. So that's why it's important in the beginning to also set the metadata at least approximately right. If you say Z resolution is three times worse or five times worse, just even a rough guess is better than no guess. So then you get this back. You have your overview here. And you're not gonna go into how to use Big Data Viewer. If you press like the, the if you press F1, uh, here you get the help for the data viewer, right? How to how to navigate, basically, and then you can also look at it from the side, right? Make sure things are okay. And okay, it's a bad example because it was the first thing is right, but basically allows you to interactively now assemble these tiles, right? If you have no idea how your uh, uh, acquisition is done, you can change this, and then you make a good guess of how to start. So this is pretty good, right? Practically. Uh, what's the file size you think you can reasonably load on a, a laptop or PC? Uh, max, I've done two, three terabytes. Really? Yeah. At some point, it becomes too slow, like, uh, but not so much. I mean, actually, to be as improved now, big data viewers, it might be even higher now. So, since it's all multi resolution and so on, it doesn't really matter, right? Like, uh, so I think it could be even bigger now with the new Big Data Viewer fixes that Tobias wrote. Because it now renders Big Data Viewer multi-threaded before it didn't do that. And then for every pixel, it looped over all sources. So if you have six sources, that's okay. If you have thousands, like a thousand tiles, that's a problem, that's really slow. Tobias fixed all of this. So I think you can actually display very big data sets. I mean, we regularly, I mean, we can easily display the fly M volume, which is 200 terabytes, it's no problem. So the, there are certain limitations, yes, but they're relatively high. So for everyday use, it should be okay. It becomes a problem if you do like the entire human brain with light sheet. That's what people want to do now, or the entire monkey brain or something like this, where you go in a petabyte range, we have to, we will hit other barriers somewhere, I'm sure. We have to see what it is, but I think for now, the hardest part will be the resaving, right? If you actually have two terabytes, resaving takes a lot of time into this. But for that, we have the cluster scripting. So if you want to do this, we can set this up for you. Spark jobs, just a script that does that. Basically, it takes the XML, resave SN5, 
this is good on the cluster and an hour later it's done. Okay, so then we are starting. One thing that I want to mention is if you, this happens to people if you get lost, you turn around and access and your sample is gone. I implemented this cool thing that Tobias should implement. You press R and it centers your sample for recenter. Very useful thing you can easily get lost. So, so let's do the very basic. You can see here it's very badly aligned, right? I mean, it takes some, it's easier when you go over. Also, color, when you press C, you do different color codes where you can kind of see, okay, this is really bad, right? Also, flip back and forth. So, basically, what we do then is basically run the alignment, right? And for this, we do a very simple phase correlation based, can only do translation. So, in many cases, that's not enough, but it's a good starting point. And the stitch data set basically is a kind of uh, holds your hand through this. There's a lot of parameters, but this is kind of, you mostly have to press OK in most cases, unless something doesn't work, but you know. It has, you have three channels, how do you want to do? You want to use just one of the channels, you want to average them, you usually want to average them, simply, you know, there's just more data. It takes, of course, longer, because there's have more data. Then it asks you, okay, do you want to complete this on full resolution or downsampled? Usually downsampling of 441, 442 is usually reasonable. You're not getting better even by doing this on full resolution because the noise is often dominant. Because we localize with subpixel accuracy. So actually the best quality and speed is a two to one or something like this. And what it does then automatically find all overlapping parts, compute phase correlations and gives you a little preview. You only need to really go into this if your stitching does not work. The first thing I do is just click apply and run <laughs> and see if it works. In case it does not work, you can go through each tile and visualize the overlapping neighbors, you see? And you can actually look at the two and look, you know, does this look good? And if it does not look good, if you example say, okay, here, that one, I, mm, I don't trust this, very little overlap. Mm, I can simply say, remove the link and it will drop the link. It will also later remove these links automatically, but I will try to remove, find the bad ones, if they don't, as, long, as long as you have enough good links, I will try to find some bad ones and throw them out. You can also filter by correlation threshold. If you say like everything above 0 0.98, I don't want, uh, and that's on. You can also filter by shift dimensions. That's very powerful sometimes. Because if your initial guess is right, you say don't move any time more than 50 pixels. If you move it more than 50 pixels, it's wrong. It will move that link that suggests to move it more by and so on. So this gives you some user input in how to filter certain things. That's just, again, most of the times you don't need it, but if it doesn't work, you can play here a lot with how to automatically remove some of these links. Then you try it run. Yeah. Two questions, sorry. Um, you're just going fast <laughs> and I want to ask them before we get too far off. Um, the first one, um, with the averaging, does that compute the alignments separately for each channel and then average the alignments together? Or does that combine the image data somehow and then compute so a single alignment? It, from it averages the image data and... Uh... Okay. So if you, want, if you want, you can easily compute each of those alignments for each channel separately. You can simply click down here, channels are grouped by default. You can ungroup these channels and compute it for each channel separately. Mm -hmm. That's that's what you can also do if you if if you think that's helpful. Usually, I mean, usually what we do is like we do stitching first, and this gets you in a good spot. Even if there's some channel misregistration, then we do an interest point based second step that that solves these small issues. Also, not with translation, but with affine. Yeah. Um, and then for the links, when you remove a link, does that mean you're no longer attempting to find an automated alignment between those two tiles, but you're just gonna determine the position of those tiles from the other links or from yes. interpolating yes. or extrapolating the, the neighboring translations? Because usually each tile is connected more than once, right? And by that, it's the position is defined by several neighbors. And if you just say, don't use that one link, it just doesn't use that one link to, de to determine the final position. Yeah, and it probably would never happen, but in, in the case where you had like, say just like a really a weird tile, like just the corner of a structure that happened to just barely be in a tile or something. 
and it removed all links because it was then it, you could just determine the position from interpolating the neighboring translations. So what it does in that case, it uh, does a two step optimization. It first optimizes all types that have connections and the ones that do not have connections, it will put according to the metadata that it has. Yeah, okay. So it will not throw it away, but we have, we have an initial guess that we put in. So we'll just keep that. And basically, but it will move it over. For example, if everything moves over, it will also move this one tile over that's not connected, just kind of keeping the metadata information as good as possible. Yeah, keep its relative position yeah. to its. Cool. There's a lot about to talk about this. Usually, again, clicking OK is fine. It will try to find out if certain links differ too much from others and kick them out. And it will handle unconnected tiles, what uh, Greg just asked. You know, if something has no link, it often happens, right? You take a mouse brain, but then all the corners are not connected. There's just nothing in there. It will keep them more or less in the right place. And it runs that, and zack, we're done. Uh, Stefan, so this is the X, Y, and Z, right? So it does the translation you need to. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So then you have your sample, more or less aligned. Um, um, then it's time to press save because then it will actually store this in this XML project. So if you don't press save from time to time and you turn it off, it's gone. So that's a good point to, to save the stuff. So wait, there was another help thing I forgot actually. Hey, where's my help? Can you, can you go detail into how the stitching is being calculated? Like, is it everything being done pairwise? One. Something. Sorry, one second. I wanted to. Eh? Yeah, something. Um, um, yeah, yeah, that's what I want to look for. So later you can look which links were actually used. To, so what it does, it computes pairwise these overlaps and then solves the global optimization, minimizing distance between all of them. And if it's like uh, what has been used like with uh, Mars, is this all done in RAM? Yeah, but it's very little. It's just a few points. It doesn't use the images anymore when it does the global optimization. No, but for the pairwise. Yeah, yeah, it does. Because once again, we have very large data sets. Suddenly we can maximize the amount of RAM on our well, thing. that's why you do it on a on a downsampling of two to one or four four two, and it only just loads these smaller. Are you say, are you resaving it as HDF five before you use it? I mean, for instance, in a Mars, it's already compressed, but um, yeah, we don't sometimes we cannot sometimes do the highest resolution level. We always have to downsample. And as I said, the image quality, the alignment quality is often better on downsampled images than using the full resolution. Really? Yeah. Why is that? Because the noise is being suppressed. When you downsample, you also reduce the noise, and then you uh, do it with subpixel accuracy. Yeah, we can do a subtraction as well prior to. But... So I mean, usually it's a waste of compute time to do stitching on full rest. There's no point in doing this, especially if you compute one translation between two big images. It's all just a waste of compute. You, it doesn't, you might want to refine it later, but not with stitching, but with an affine model using interest points, that's a different thing. And again, then you don't only have the points that you work on. So usually memory is never an issue really, unless you have a single image that is actually terabytes in size. But even then it will only load the part that it needs. Yeah, the overlap like, region. Because that's one of the blocked format, right? It will only load whatever it needs. So I, in practical cases, you will not run into memory issues there. We often did. Hmm? We often did. But that's the parameter setting then, I would say that is wrong. If you use- If we use the highest resolution. It's still surprising. I mean, it could be because you still, if you have 64 cores, it does 64 at the same time, right? So then if you want to do it at full resolution, which I again advise not to do because I don't think there's any good reason to do this, but if you do it, then reduce the parallelism. Say only do four at the time. So, uh, because of course, if you then do 64, 128 at the same time, it loads 128 images at full res at the same time. 256 actually, right? Because of overlapping pairs. Then it does free Fourier transforms on it, blah, 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 right? So. That, that could run out of memory, yeah. But again, don't do it at full rest. Okay, I won't have. No advantages, 
really adding a second opinion i completely agree with stefan that usually um images are oversampled with respect to the features that you actually want to line up. Usually the things that you're going to look at as a human to decide if it's lined up or not are 10, 15 voxels at least in size. So aligning at full resolution just gives the alignment algorithm lots of opportunities to find bad matches that it shouldn't find because of noise. OK. What you can then do is, that's what I said, you can refine the whole alignment using interest points. And this is our try at doing this as user-friendly as possible, but you have to do almost zero input, because usually it means several steps, finding interest points, finding the right parameters to match it, blah, 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 blah. Here, we try to do this automatically, basically select at which level you want to find interest points. If you want to do all tiles, if you want to do chromatic operation or all together, which means if you do tile registration, it will not move the channels relative to each other for each tile. Video chromatic aberration, it will only move the channels relative to each other. And if you do all together, it will leave everything free. So as long, I mean, you don't want to move the channels relative to each other if you have no bleed through. If you don't have no signal that is in common between these images, there's no point in doing this, right? Because they're just going to be destroyed. That's the case in this one. There's not much feed, uh, bleed through from one channel to the other. Often you have a lot of out of fluorescence, then this works great. Here not. So that's why you use tile registration. It automatically extracts interest points. Here we see this here in the background. optimizes and applies. So if you now, for example, switch to multi-view mode, if you're stitching mute and multi-view mode, just I wanted to show you this quickly, there's an interest point explorer, which is interesting because you can actually look which, which points are found to be overlapping, which it used now to refine this registration, which can be interesting. You can also look at all it found and the ones it actually used. Why are there points? Like, like, oh. ah, okay. uh, so red is when they're currently in focus. So if you turn this around, you see it's like actually. Yeah. So put right. the points are projected, so you... right? So uh, yeah. yes. Sense. But it's just a way to kind of get some idea of mm -hmm. what was used. But I think but the question. Just... Well, for me also, why are there points in the non-overlapping region? Currently, like the points that were matched, of course, are in overlapping regions of the tiles, but it looked like the interest point detection also ran in regions of the data that were only collected once, like in, a, in the interior of a tile. That's, that, that's a fair point. It runs it for the entire image because, I mean, it should be, I mean, at this point, I could, I could also have called the chromatic aberration correction, then you need it everywhere. So there was, there, there's no, there's no uh, uh, question in the code there saying, which mode did you call? It just finds the interest points and runs it. Fast enough doesn't that wouldn't save a considerable amount of time to ignore the rest of the tiles in this case. In this case, I think it. I mean, for this small, it doesn't make a difference. For bigger, it would actually make a difference. But usually, I no, it's actually a good point. We should add this. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. That, that that's a bit of a waste of. You, I mean, you would, might you want to increase this a bit by ten percent, right? Because you might actually move it around. But uh, yeah, you could definitely limit this to this area to find the interest points only there. Fair point, yeah. yeah, yeah. So this is a very basic alignment. Oops, it's like all right. That's a very basic alignment. So usually the last step that you want to do is then export that volume into a few stack. For that, if you don't want to export everything, you can define a bounding box which is here. You can give it a name. Then you can interactively say, hey, I only want to do parts of the image. Or in Z, this is too big. I want to do half of the image. It usually makes sense if you have a large data sets, you just want to export a little thing at full rest to see if it's actually good. And you don't want to, because exporting the full thing at full rest might, as I said, take a long time on a cluster. So two ways of fusion you do, either you downsample everything for fusion, or you select a small box to check if, if things are right. So in this case, I just, you know, why upper part here, it's sort of a redundant bounding box. Then it tells you how big this image would be if you would fuse that. So now you can do image fusion. 
And there's a lot of parameters, right? So it basically asks you which bounding box you want to use. By default, it always suggests the views you're currently selected and all views. In this case, it's the same because I have uh, all selected. Or you can select the bounding box that you did. Let's do all views. You can do downsampling. So it's very fast. If you say at the beginning, I want an eight times downsampled image, it will give you a two megabyte. In this case, very small. In other cases, very useful. Interpolation, yeah, I mean, I could actually move this. I think nobody really wants the nearest neighbor anymore. It's a kind of a pointless thing. Pixel type, meanwhile, supported 32, 16, and 8 bit output. And I will get a bit into this because there's some little new tricks. Because I just recently added 8 bit output, and it's related to a legacy problem with BDV, Big Data Viewer, that it saves everything in 16 bit, the input data. So the problem is if you actually had an 8 put input file, it will still save it as 16 bit. It doesn't lose anything because it compresses it anyways and stuff. But you don't know your range, your initial range. And assuming it goes only from 0 to 255, and you save this as to 0 to 65535, if you now say save it to 8 bit, it will further compress it. You will only have a range from 0 to 16. So that's why I never had this in there because it's a bit complicated. But for many outputs that we support now, 8 bit is actually useful. So that's why I put it back in now. But if you select 8 bit, it will ask you other questions that are related to this legacy feature that Big Data Viewer saves all inputs at 16-bit. Let's first do the simple one, 32-bit, is if you don't know what you're doing and you just want to see what's happening, no questions there because it's unlimited in range. You can do a non-rigid alignment based on these interest points. I'm not going to go into this now. Also not useful for this data. I mean, I think it's over solving something. You usually want to blend these images. It applies a cosine blending function at the overlaps, basically meaning the closer you are to a boundary of the image, the weight of the image goes down. If there's no other image, it will still be fully there. But if there's another image that's a higher weight, the other image will get more uh, 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 prioritized. So that you get better smooth blending. Why cosine? Because I think you used to use linear for some of your other older stitching packages. Because it has less artifacts. It's, it's, it's a very smooth function for the weight. I mean, we could use any other function, but cosine is a very natural choice, right? It goes from one to zero. In a... Okay, so just intuitively smoother. And you can see it. Like uh, linear, we used very, very, very early on. This has changed a long time ago. So because cosine just looks much better. And also, we don't actually do a cosine. We use a lookup function. It is not that we compute the cosine. So it's, 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 it's also as fast, basically. Mm -hmm. We have a content-based fusion, which is actually not that slow anymore. I could remove this warning. Uh, uh, mostly important for multi-view data, where you say, I have one image, do two images overlap, and one is significantly sharper than the other one. Then you want to estimate the local contrast or the local yeah, resolution in some sense in that image and prioritize the ones that are not blurry over the ones that are blurry. So in this case, it makes absolutely no sense, but uh, it makes sense for multi-view images. <clears throat> and the last one is specifically important, important for this type of data sets. Preserve the original data anisotropy. So usually you want to do this for the times that you just tiled. Because usually you oversample x, y compared to z. And, there's, and Big Data Viewer, by default, makes everything isotropic. Also, the way it shows it to you is isotropic. But you don't want to save it that way. That's it's just a waste. This only makes sense if you have one data acquired like this and the other one like this. Then you want to save it you know, uh, isotropic. And it will also update. Images, of course, get a third smaller, and it will just basically apply a, a squeezing in Z uh, to get it back to the original uh, size. I think the question related to this is, can you explain, um, like, what you just said, I guess, is why the top, the bounding box is 900 by 1400 by 200 something, whereas the bottom dimension is like yeah. 900 by 1400 by, uh, yeah. Uh, See, if I, if, if, if I yeah, take exactly. it, it updates yeah, that. Exactly. Yeah. So that's, yes. So the, is that from the initial guess or is that updated? There's no updated. That's that's what you put in. So then, yeah. I mean, there's no way for, for the software to know, right? Yeah. You, you can guess that if you have multi-view data, then you can actually guess it. But if you have just one orientation, there's no way to, to, to know. I mean, I want to say no way, but it's very, very hard to say what's, at which point is it? Yeah. What's actual scaling? So a related, possibly annoying question is the like the transformations that it's between the tiles. 
Are those in like pixel coordinates of the tile, or are they in like the world coordinates of the switching space or something? They are in pixel coordinates. So, um, yeah, it's on pixel coordinates, yes. It's on pixel coordinates, and then each tile, the first transformation is to map it into a global space, yeah. but basically it's all relative to the local pixel coordinates of each. So, so, so in, every input image has a pixel grid, and yeah. then a transformation to put it into global space. And this does nothing else than applying an affine at the end that inverses uh, three times, which is not 100% correct, because now we have an affine, so it actually, but, but it just squeezes it, and usually it's fine. Then you can produce a fused image for each time point and channel. That's what you usually want to do. You don't want to fuse all channels into one image. I mean, you know, you can still do it, each of, of views together. Who knows? And you can do the opposite each view. If you do each view, it would create now 18 images, all the full size. Then you can later on. It's very useful if you actually want to look in your software at the overlaps. You know, they can inspect that as you want. I hardly use this, but it's just something you sometimes want to do. You don't actually want to mesh the images together, but kind of just transform them, basically. This just applies a transformation to each input image individually and puts it into global space. Another question. Um, so most workflows probably end in image fusion, but do, do, have you ever encountered a case where the endpoint was taking the transform data itself and providing that as input to some downstream step? instead of just fusing the image and then working with the fused image? Yeah, cell tracking. So for example, for the, for the multi-view case, if we then use Mastodon or something to track the cells, we're, we're, we're done at this point because it opens the same XML and big data view and then you can start tracking. It doesn't actually fuse the images. It, it, it just basically applies the transformations on the fly. Mm -hmm. So that's a very common example where, where people do that. You still might want to do it for efficiency reasons because the image just gets much smaller if you fuse six or seven images into one. Unless you make ex explicit views of the different views, you might still want to do it simply because it reduces your data set size significantly. But yeah, yeah, we, we, we do this for that, yeah. Well, the reason I ask is about John's question, which is you're saving the transforms in voxel units, which are specific to the data set. Would you consider, uh, this might, you know, it's such a fundamental decision and you're interacting with a lot of other tools, but would you ever consider switching that to having transforms encoded in physical units? That's, uh, I, in my view, that's just a little bit more um, communicable yeah. for tools. Like it's easier for, uh, you know, for one tool. It, like it, it requires less additional metadata to be passed around with the transforms. So we, we I mean, I don't want to say we do a hybrid, but we do some sort of hybrid. It's always the first transformation that we have is not computed, but it maps the pixel space into the physical space that you defined for your data set. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so in the beginning, I said, for example, one micron per pixel, one micron per pixel, three microns per pixel. There are modes where you define this data set, but you can have a different measure for each image that you provide. I don't go through this, but you can do this. Then each of the input image has a different first transform that you usually never touch. That is basically just mapping. That's the first thing, pixel space into micrometer space. I mean, it's a completely arbitrary defined. Basically the voxel spacing, but in, on the diagonal and with the right minus signs in places for like your conventions for the axes. And, and sometimes we have specific importers that also do mirroring of the data and other things, right? To, you know, we have sometimes you have cameras that are opposite and the data is mirrored, then you multiply by minus one in X or stuff like that. So we have a set of, so you can easily extract that if you want that, but it's not really a feature, but, but, but the information is in there to do that. Yeah, so I see what you mean. The the file that you're the XML that you're creating would would only take a small amount of parsing to change it from taking voxel coordinates as input to taking physical coordinates as input. You would just ignore that that big uh, enough, right? But uh, can okay. you see this? Yeah, I can see it. So here's the the first is always oh what happened now? It's always the calibration, right? So that basically says in order to go into our global physical space, you multiply by three, right? Mm -hmm. And this also has a name, it's called calibration. So you can extract these types of things if you want. And then just the second and third transformation is actually, this second one applies to stitching. The third one then does a translation and that's it, right? So that's basically the, 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 the one that we that we found out. Got it. So, so each, each, 
So, so, so we save the steps of transformations for each uh, uh, image in, input image. We don't mesh them together. Sometimes it's 10 or 12 affine transformations. Of course, if we render it, we, we condense it into one, but it's stored as a chain of transformations that is being applied. Same as in Trachium and everywhere, so it's a cha chain of transformations. Yeah, yeah no, no, this so, makes sense. This is like keeping everything organized and separate and, and findable. It makes sense. Also, you can do things like, you know, remove the latest transformation. If you're not happy with this ICP, you simply remove it and you go one step back. I don't want to do it now, but, you know. Or you can even remove the first, <laughs> which, I mean. That would really basically be ignoring the voxel spacing, right? Removing exactly, yeah. yeah. I don't even know I could remove that too. It's pretty pointless. One second. Okay, fusion, fusion, fusion. So hope you remember these things. Hello, no, we don't want to do hello. It, it, it remembers things when you press okay, not when you press cancel, which is actually nice, right? So it's a 32 bit. I do a downsampling of two just if we don't wait. Original anisotropy. Okay, I will see you right. So the easiest one is to display it in image. It was pop up in image plus, if you do it in safe or whatever. The problem, of course, is this can be too big, right? If you have a very large data set, it's not what you want. You also don't want to save this as a compressed TIFF stack because that does exactly that. Call the image a save function. This fails typical, typically, for example, if it doesn't fit into RAM. It, 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 it actually does it virtually, so it's okay. But for example, if the XY is more than 2, million, 2 billion pixels, it doesn't work. So there's other exports. For example, the ZAR and 5 HD5 export, which uses the N5 API. So you can basically save arbitrarily or almost arbitrarily sized images is just for each block do right and saves out the block so it doesn't matter how big the image is we now support c dragon export for 2d so sometimes we wanted to uh, export 2d data large 2d data so it's open c dragon is actually pretty cool for that you can kind of zoom in and out it's a web-based thing and we also support now large 2d tiff export for 2d images sometimes it's nice also maybe you want to print this out or use one slice you know just uh, but sometimes image only supports up to forty thousand by 40,000 pixels in XY. If it's bigger than that, it will crash. If you have an image that's actually bigger than that and you want to export that, you can do that now because it uses a large 2D TIFF writer. I mean, I mean, this is only important either if you do science that uses just stage scanning in 2D or for artistic reasons. Yeah, but. So typically I do this now just for the sake of it. It asks you how you want to display it. You can do a cache display, which will show it immediately, right? And, and just compute things on the fly as you go through the data set. You can pre-compute the whole thing. It asks you, you know, what the initial intensity display range you want that you see something. And you can do advanced block size options where it asks you things like, okay, for the caching, which block size you want to use. So we make educated guesses, but sometimes you have very specific data and you want to do something else, then you can do that. I just do the cache now for the fun of it, right? And it basically shows up immediately. It shows three images because it's three different channels. And as you go through, it computes things on the fly, which in this case is fast enough. It's multi-threaded and so on. And then you can save this or merge this. You see the little V here, so it's virtual, right? It's a cache cell image underlying that image a virtual stack for those who program with this stuff. They do image color merge channels. In this case, it will actually now make copies, especially if I say keep source image. That's why it takes a little bit. There's your fused data set. The, so, I, I want to call it the optic tectum, but that's just because I do zebra fish. The, the, I guess those are the, that's the brain, like the two lobes on the top, mm -hmm. the peripheral parts. They look kind of distorted to me, but that's just in the data, right? Or is that just what yeah, that's, that's, look like? These are things for three genes, right? I didn't even know. I forgot which genes those were. Like, uh, there's just, uh, I think that's the optic lobe here. I don't know what they stained there. Okay. It was just a random sample. But that's, that's just how it looks. Right? Yeah, and that's not even close to an overlapping tile boundary. It's just, yeah, how it looks. Yeah. Okay. So um, I don't think it makes sense to go into the other data. So I want to show you a bit more of the fusion uh, uh, 
magic. So let's say we want to do an 8-bit 8-bit export. Makes a lot of sense here because the input was actually 8-bit. And let's say we want to save, what do you want to save? Let's say in HDF5. You want to save an HDF5 fused. Let's do it at full res now. So now there's a lot of text. It's important to read this. That's what I just said, right? Uh, it, it automatically found the input range from 0 to 65535. So what I could do is, of course, I could actually load the data and see what it is. But I don't want to do this because it could be big. It could be expensive. So I, I don't actually touch the data. All I look is at the type of the data. I look, is this 16-bit? Is this 8-bit? What is the input type? And it's 16-bit. So it says automatically found 0 to 655. And it asks you, is that correct? Is that actually the range? And this will all change because Tobias will support 8-bit in the future. And then I will still leave this question, but it's going to be right then. But now we know, OK, no, I manually want to define the input range because it's not 0 to 65535. It is actually 0 to 255. And I know that. Right, so that's a bit hacky, but I think it's important to know if you want to do this. It would still work if you do it otherwise, but the, but the, the image space and uh, the, the intensity space would be very compressed. It would look like very funny, like you wouldn't really see things. So now it asks you which of the three formats. Let's do HDF5. And then you can just create an HDF5 as a container, or you can create a BDV, Big Stitcher compatible export meaning it creates an HDF5 or an N5 together with this XML that you can open it again in Big Stitcher on Big Data Viewer to look at it. So whatever, it depends on, I think usually most people want that, I guess. With ZAR that's not yet supported, will be in the future though, because we don't support ZAR as an input data format yet, which is related to that right now we're changing Big Data Viewer to actually use the N5 API, and then we can use all of it, but to be as hard-coded basically by HDF5 and N5 support. But He's, it's actually about to change, I think, another month or two, and we will support all of it. But this, we still have to decide, right? You can just write out any N5 SAR container. And then if you, if you don't do that, it will actually ask you, how do you want to, you know, what's the base data set? Where do you want to put this in? You know, you can basically, an HDF5 N5 SAR is like a directory structure. You can call this, hello, Jimmy, right? You can name this whatever you want. It's basically a, a folder inside that HDF5 or N5. But of course, if you want any software to load this automatically, there are certain standards where they go. Right? So, so if I do this, nobody else but a plain HDF5 reader will be able to read this. But they will be able to read this. So I'm not going to do this. I want to show you that you can do it. right? But for example, if you know my, my, my next step is I want to write this R, and later I want to run my whatever machine learning pipeline on it. And I have other, you can just save however you want. Right? But if you want to save it compatible to, oh, I didn't remember that. Oh, I should remember that. It asks also different questions. It basically just asks you, okay, where does the H5 file, where does the XML go to? And then it tells you, okay, by default, I will use that block size. And I will use a compute block size that is different. Because if the block size is small, you don't want to run each CPU thread for such a small block. Then you want to say, OK, I actually compute in much bigger blocks and then save eight blocks out at once. Right? So and it just shows, shows you what it will do by default. If you're not happy with this, you can change that and say, OK, I know better. I want something else. Usually, it should be OK. But I think for many people, it's good that I advance and say, I want something else, or performance is better if you do that or that. And you press OK. Yeah, makes a new folder fused. It tells you basically how many compute blocks it is. 192 compute blocks. And it, it altogether writes 8,000 blocks. And then it takes around 11 seconds per image to write. That's a reasonable, it's not that small at the end. It's like a gigabyte at the end. And then it's done. And now I save this. Save all the interest points. Then I can, for example, open. By default, it remembers our last project, but it made a fused folder. So there's our new data set that simply has like one angle, three channels, one tile. So it's a fused one. 
and we can open that and look at it. And so now we have a data set. You can just as well, it's an HDF5, meaning you can open it also here with the HDF5 loader. You have to specify the HDF5 file. It will open that. And you can basically, you see what it created, right? It created this. It didn't create the multi resolution pyramid, it only created the full REST version. In the future, we also want to be able to support that. That you say, okay, also create a multi resolution version. Right now, it doesn't do that. But you can also say, let's load that. That's also how you load, by the way, any HDF5 data set. You just go there. And I think the N5 importer supports that too, right? So the other way to load this is the, it should be called N5 API loader, yeah. right? Not N5 loader. It's a bit confusing yeah. because it also supports ZAR, N5, and HDF5 to load. I think they'll call it, yeah, HDF5, N5, ZAR. Then put it. I've actually never done it that way. So you put this here, right? Oh, that's sad. I think you can grab it. Yeah, drag and drop support. Yeah. Yeah, that's sad. Where do I have this? Downloads. <clears throat> huh? Okay. How oh, do I find this now? It's called too many downloads. What? How did I call this folder? I call this HTIG. Why is it not here? Even being able to type would be great. Uh, Ah, because it, yeah, file, folder, uh, stitching, fused, and then it shows you, I don't know, I would like, for example, to open this oh. buggy bug. Anyhow, if you would have saved an N5, that's the way how you load it then. But that should work, right? Because it loads those and it doesn't load those. Yeah, I'm all here. I'll try this. Good find. Because I can definitely load it with the HN5 API. Yeah, exactly. Okay. In any case, that's then how you save things. And that's about time. Are there other questions? I mean, that were related to what I showed now. There's a lot of other things you can do with it, right? But it's just a basic workflow. Just to make sure I understood, the Fusion doesn't do multi-resolution, or that was a choice you made when you did the Fusion? It does not support yeah. multi-resolution okay. yet, okay. but it's also on the to-do. I mean, we have a lot of things that we want to add here and there, right? It also depends if somebody really needs it, I would do it first. Like, or maybe Michael wants to give it. I mean, you have the code lying around. It's just like... It's a bit harder to do multi-resolution for these data sets. They're like anisotropic, <coughs> having to guess these factors right. And it's more like the, the, the trick is more like in the little things. But yeah, it, it could easily do it. But also often you might not even want this, right? Like depends on what your next step is. I also want to support to save it in a format for NeuroGlenser right away to set the right metadata tags. That you can put it there as well and it easily works and all these types of things. But we've changed all of this now that Tobias changes the VDV underlying libraries for loading and saving. Then all of this will be addressed. Uh, There's a question over from Craig. Oh, Greg, sorry. sorry. Now we're too small. Now we can't really see. You. Yeah, I was just trying to make space for others as I talked a bunch during the. Thing. If there were other questions, they could go first. No, go for it. Okay. Um, so when you guys add the um, support for sending the compute heavy steps to the cluster, how do you imagine that looking in the in the GUI? And how does it? It's a, it's, a, it it's not really? the GUI. Basically, what you do is something like this, right? You 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 build this on a command line. You do dot slash install, and then you simply call that command line parameters the XML the output, which format, mid, max, and then it does it. 
Okay, so you, so you like so run the steps that you need to in the GUI, which produce outputs, then you switch to the terminal, run an appropriate command that can consumes those outputs from, from the GUI, and then runs your cluster job, and then you go back to the GUI with the outputs of the cluster job? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, in, in, in this case, it will just create a new file. So that's kind of boring. But if you would say for, for the resaving, it will create XML or will create a new XML. And then you basically open that one again. Mm -hmm. So that's I basically know. the workflow right now. Cool. Um, other question. Big Stitcher used to have its own GUI, right? But now it's all do, gone going through Fiji. Um, just curious, what's the, the history of that? Are you still going to work on the, the Big Stitcher independent GUI? I mean, it is its independent GUI. I mean, in some sense, just like this is all here, right? Mm -hmm. Which is just a Java window, right? That has not much to do with. Yeah. I mean, we, I mean it, it, it relies much more on Big Data Viewer than it does on Fiji. The only yeah. where we actually use Fiji is for macro recording. That's why we still use all these ugly. Uh, dialogues because they have the function of macro recording mm -hmm. so that means you can macro so if you want to macro record everything not all functionality of most functionality is here batch processing you know, all these things are here but basically always if you do something like fuse data set basically ask you okay where's the xml so this is all macro recordable then so like the specific steps you could macro record and then exchange whatever the original input file path or something or you can say, okay, here I want to fuse just one time point. I select a single time point, then you do this to do to, to, to for example parallelize things or yeah, cool. Awesome. So for running on the cluster, it's something that will take time to explain. It depends on which steps you want to run on the cluster. Well, particularly the fusion, but uh but you have like many files or big files because it's Many files is very easy to parallelize. Big files, big files, it's pretty easy. I mean, you need this, the big such as Spark, you run it, and that's it. I mean, well, potentially time points, so there's split files. I mean, it's pretty easy. I mean, we have to set it up, but that's basically an hour with, with, with Eric or so, and he would make a script for you, and then you can run it. Basically, the hard part is to have the first script, and to change little things and do it a bit different is easy. Right, so the hard part is just to at the end you call something a command line, you call Spark Fuse and the XML and five parameters, and that's it. And then you can change this as you want. So that's how we have it set up, for example. But of course, you have to set it up for wherever your file paths are with your username, blah 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 blah. Right. But if you use this regularly, it's very easy to use. I think. Wow, it's about the activation. There, right? uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, that could be another how to. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I, I would be interested in a how to on Big Stitcher Spark or just Spark there stuff is in one, general because I don't know. Eric has done one already. It's on YouTube. We did this, we did this oh. for the I2K 2022. Okay. Eric did a how to Spark, how to do Big Stitcher, Big Stitcher Spark so that that exists. I mean, I'm not sure if it goes into all the details necessary because we try to be more generic, not specifically the generic cluster, but how do you do it in general with the example of how you do it here. But we could have a if, if there are enough people interested, we could make a little meeting, two hours, and set it up for everyone. It's not that hard. It's more like little details. Like Yeah. Yeah. Things. Well, that's why it seems like it'd be nice to have a how to is to just sort out all those little details instead of slowly teaching myself to sort out all those. Because, I mean, details. even how do you even spin up a Spark cluster, yeah. originally a cluster, right? Yeah, because yeah. we don't have a Spark instance running all the time. So there's specific scripts just for that that sometimes change. Uh, yeah. if, if they upgrade something. So a lot of it is just because we don't have a Spark and all that stuff are the same thing, right? There is. Janelia, Spark, Janelia, Dask, whatever scripts that you need to know where they are. Mm -hmm. We only use them, but sometimes they change. And, you know. Yeah, yeah, I dabbled in Flintstone. So basically, to to so basically what you do is like you, it's working. you say, make me a Spark cluster using yeah. 200 nodes. Yeah. And then, you know, deploy that jar. So you have to build a Fed jar. So that's different because uh, basically you need a jar that is all the code that contains all the dependencies. Right, you don't set the Fiji, send the Fiji instance around. If you have scripts for all of this, it, you know, yeah. you basically, it's. I can show you what you have to do is something. Not knife, but yeah, and I'll definitely check out Eric's. Yeah. You do MVN clean package. I forgot. You, I forgot to. So, so if you add some other name here, and it builds you the fetch jar. It basically makes a job with dependencies. Ah, I think. 
minus p fed jar, I think it was it. And then it builds you this fed jar of the current version. And we can even put this somewhere centrally, the current up-to-date version. And that's basically what you need to sp specify in your Spark script. How big the cluster, where's the jar that you want to run? What are the command line parameters for that fed jar? And the command line parameters I explained here. Mm -hmm. They're pretty simple. You can add some new ones if you know. Because this is much less than the GUI allows you to do, right? You have just a few. So I haven't implemented everything that the GUI does for there. That's the most common things. But it's easy to, to add that, for example. So there's a little bit of, but it, it could be an interesting how to actually, like uh, how to how to set this up. And if you have several projects like this, not only Big Stitcher, right? Like how do you run uh, also Hot Knife? I mean, if people want to run this themselves, but the, the, the other projects, I mean, what, what, once you notice the other Java projects where this can be useful, like how to just run Spark. Yeah, I would definitely be interested in that myself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would delegate this to Eric because he knows this much better than I do. Like everything that I run on Spark, I did this in the beginning myself. Now Eric does everything because he's just faster with this. Like there's no point in it. Cool, then thanks so much everyone for coming. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you.